Well, good morning. Good morning. Certainly is good to see everyone out. You know, a question I got asked this week a lot uh, when Haley and I, well, last week when we were at the hospital was nurses and doctors would ask us, isn't it hard living in Utah when you have family so far away? And we responded to that by saying, yeah, you know, obviously it is. We, we miss our family dearly. They're in states very far away. But we also explained that we do have family here, a rather large family that we are so thankful for. Uh, Haley and I have just been, first of all, praying thankfulness to the Lord for the health and safety, safety of Russell over the last 10 days, but also for the congregation, our church family here. Uh, your outpouring of love has just been uh, so encouraging to us this week, so I wanted to thank you all for that, and y'all, we got some really good cooks here that can definitely get, give some good meals, so we appreciate that as well. But it's good to be back with you this morning to study from God's Word. If you do have your Bible out, if it's not out already, please take it and turn it over to Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah 35, we're going to be studying about a family there in just a second. It's good to see a number of visitors, as Paul mentioned. We have a lot of visitors with us this morning. It's good to see Jacob and Bailey with us as well. Glad that they've had a safe move out here and excited for them to be uh, part of the number here. But I want you to consider this question for a second. How, how well do you know your family? How, how well do you know your family? And what I mean by that is your lineage, your ancestors. Like, could you name off all of your great grandparents? What about your great, great grandparents? See, maybe there, there's some of us, maybe a very small portion that may know our great, great grandparents, may, may know their names. But does that really mean you know who they were, their jobs, where they lived, their, their beliefs that they professed? It's amazing that in just a few generations, we forget those before us. Or what about this? Could, could you remember your ancestors, your lineage? Could you trace it all the way back to the year eight, 1782? Could you, could you do that? And you might say that's a random year to pick, PJ. Well, it's for a purpose. That's 240 years ago. And why that matters is because we're going to be studying about this family in Jeremiah 35 called the Rechabites. The Rechabites. And we don't know much about this family in Scripture. The first mention that we really have of Rechab is that he was a part of the Kenites, whose descendants trace all the way back to Jethro. Remember that? Father-in-law of Moses. And so this is a family that likely that married into Israel, wasn't even a part of the original uh, promises to that family. And we don't see Rechab mentioned again until we get to 2 Kings chapter 10, where Josh read for us in that scripture reading, where we come across this man named Jehonadab. It's the son of Rechab. And he's asked that question, you know, by Jehu. Is, is your heart true to my heart as mine is to yours? And you can imagine Jehu is told to be a crazy chariot driver. And so his answer is, uh, yeah, it is. And so he gets up in this chariot and he experiences firsthand the zeal of the Lord. I mean, the zeal that Jehu had for the Lord. And so why does all this matter? Well, because in Jeremiah chapter 35, we're going to read about this family called the Rechabites. And Jeremiah is told to do something uh, to them. And so let's read these first couple of verses here in Jeremiah 35. Jeremiah 35, we'll start in verse 1. And it says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, go to the house of the Rechabites. And speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers. Then offer them wine to drink. And I don't normally do this, but I'm going to skip over verses 3 and 4. And if you're wondering why, just look at some of the names there. I don't know how to pronounce them. It's funny, I asked, I asked Josh if he wanted to read these verses for the scripture reading. And he wisely chose 2 Kings 10. So a good choice there, Josh. But let's pick up in verse 5 after we get a mention of some of the names of the different uh, family members there. It says, Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, Drink wine. But they answered, We will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, You shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house. You shall not sow seed. You shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. 
We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, and all that he commanded us to drink no wine with all our days, ourselves, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, and not to build houses to dwell in. We have no vineyards or field or seed, but we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come, let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and the army of the Syrians. So we are living in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah is told by God to get these Rechabites, bring them into the temple and offer them wine to drink. And it's important that we have a clear understanding of how the Rechabites respond. They're given and offered these pitchers of wine before them. And what do they say? No. More more than just no, it is a very adamant no. We're not going to drink this wine. And the reasoning for that is because of what Jonadab, their forefather, the son of Rechab, told them. And this is the same. It may say Jonadab. Some of your translations may say Jehonadab. It's the same man that we read about in 2 Kings chapter 10. And so we have, we know the distance between 2 Kings 10 and Jeremiah 35 when Jehoiakim is king. This is a a span of nearly 240 years. And so 240 years have gone by and what are they doing? They're still following what Jonadab has taught. Saying, hey, you don't drink wine even when it's offered to you, nor your wives, nor yourselves, nor your sons, nor your daughters. And that's what they follow. And they make it very clear that, hey, we're not going to drink this wine. In fact, they give an other list of other things they're not going to do. We don't, have tent, we don't have homes. We don't have vineyards. We live in tents as nomads. No, and if, you're, if this is your first time reading Jeremiah 35, which for a number of you I'm sure it probably is, not a go-to chapter oftentimes, you may be thinking, what on earth? Why, why does God have Jeremiah do this? Well, what's the point? Why does God send Jeremiah to a people and, and maybe... Almost, it looks like he tempts them, saying, hey, here's some wine to drink. And I think it's important to note a difference between testing someone and tempting them. We know from the New Testament that the Lord, he does not tempt people. But he does test his people at times. And under the law, these things wouldn't have been sinful for them to do. And so if you're going to this passage and think that, you know, wine to have a justification for drinking today, the wine that's mentioned here is simply off the vine. We're talking about grape juice that's offered to them. And they say, no, we're not going to drink that. But like the character of Job, I think it becomes apparent that God knew when he sent Jeremiah to the Rechabites that they weren't going to drink this. He knew that that was going to be the case because notice how this chapter ends. Let's pick up in verses 12 through the end of the chapter. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the people of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words, declares the Lord? The command that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, gave to his sons to drink no wine has been kept, and they drink none to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent to to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way, and amend your deeds, and do not go after other gods to serve them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to you and to your fathers. But you do not incline your ear or listen to me. Verse 16, The sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have kept the command that their father gave them. But this people has not obeyed me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, and they have not listened. I have called to them, and they have not answered. But to the house of the Rechabites, Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done all that he commanded you, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall never lack a man to stand before me. So maybe if we, after we read that first part, if you're wondering, what's the point of this? Why are these Rechabites offered wine to drink? The answer is given in the second half of the chapter. That the Rechabites are used as an illustration and an example for Israel to learn from. The people of Judah, they don't obey the word of the Lord. 
Unlike, that's contrasted with the obedience, the faith that the Rechabites had to follow the commands of Jonathan, who lived 240 years before them. God persistently spoke to them through the prophets, and they did not listen. And as a result, disaster is going to come. And so the point is this, that if the Rechabites were this faithful to their forefather, how much more should Judah have been faithful to their Lord? That's the point of this chapter and what the Lord is trying to get across to his people. And so as we think about this family of the Rechabites in this chapter, I want to offer and end with three applications, three points for us to take home as we think about this family and to make some applications to our lives today. And the first is we need to listen like the Rechabites. That's part of how they are extolled by the Lord in this example, that they listen. Ten times in this chapter, a form of the word listen or obey is used. You can't read this chapter without that being emphasized. Listening and obedience. And we'll talk about obedience later, but for now, I want to talk about listening. You know, are you someone that is a good listener? I don't know many of us that would be quick to raise our hand and say, yeah, I'm a really good listener. Why, why is that, that we struggle with listening? Well, one of the reasons is because we live in an age where there's so many distractions readily available. It's hard to carry on a conversation with someone when they don't have a phone in their hand, or there's not a TV on in the background, or music playing. It, there's all this other stimulus happening, and so it's hard to really listen. It's kind of like what Jesus talked about in Matthew 13, that, yeah, you have ears, but do you really hear? And that would be why some wouldn't listen and understand the parables. Yeah, they had ears, but they weren't able to truly listen. We hear a lot of words, but are we actually listening to that? And most importantly, are we listening to what God has said? New Testament reveals that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. And so are we listening to what God's Word has said and revealed to us? Now, I want, I want you to notice there in verses 12 through 14 that this is God's main frustration with his people, Judah, at this time. And the emphasis is that they were not listening. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, Go and say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words? Or then at the end of verse 14, what does God say? I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. They weren't listening. And it's easy to pick up on the tone of this passage, the second half. God is frustrated with his people. He's repeatedly talked to them, repeatedly sent prophet after prophet after prophet, and they don't listen. And what a frustrating situation that is. Now, here's the irony of the situation. That God is sending these prophets and prophets and prophets for people of Judah to wake up, to repent from their sin, and they don't listen. And if you go down to the next chapter, some of you may have a heading in Jeremiah 36 that says, Jehoiakim burns Jeremiah's scroll. And that's a graphic illustration of the very problem Jeremiah 35 is talking about. That Jeremiah has a message from the Lord, writes it on a scroll, gives it to King Jehoiakim. And what does Jehoiakim do? He doesn't just burn it. That's part of it. But it tells us that it's winter and it was cold and he's sitting by the fire and he takes a knife out and he cuts up the scroll and then he tosses it in the fire. That is a graphic illustration of the situation in Judah. That's how they are listening. Not at all. And I know we might feel good about ourselves because, you know, we would never burn the Bible. We, we would never cut it. We maybe hear stories about people that sharpie out lines of the Bible that they don't like. You know, we would never do that. We need to ask ourselves, how, how well do we listen when God's word speaks to us? You know, especially I want to make a point to our young children, but this applies to more than just children. But I do hope that the young ones that are filling out the handouts or maybe listening, that they're paying attention. Because Ephesians 6 and verse 1 says what? It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children are commanded to obey their parents. And that's an important thing. But you know what a large part of obedience is? It involves listening, active listening to what you are being taught. 
And this is such a serious thing. We see it listed in what a, what a depraved society looks like in Romans 1 and verse 30. In that list of all these different sins, we typically go to passages like this to point out homosexuality. But you know what else appears in the list in Romans 1? People that were disobedient to parents. People that didn't listen to parents. And so kids, I know when your parents tell you what to do, you may not like it. It may not seem fair. But you need to obey them. You need to listen to them. Listen like the Rechabites did, following and listening to them. But I don't want us to miss the spiritual point of all this, a huge spiritual point, that if we are supposed to and commanded to listen and obey our earthly fathers, how much more should we be listening to our heavenly father, listening to all that he has commanded us? And so let's make sure that that is most emphasized in our homes, listening to God. Listening to his word. But I think about another application from this chapter. Not just listening like the Rechabites, but we need some teachers. We, we need people that would step up and teach like Jonadab. Now, something I hope you notice uh, in this chapter, I mean, it's almost, it jumps off the page. The Rechabites come into the temple of all places with a prophet of God. And it is in that setting that they are tempted not by God, but to, to break personal convictions. Not that if they would have drank, it would have been sin, but it would have broken a personal conviction that their family had. And that's a lesson right there, a sub-lesson in, the, in this whole point here, that we may be tempted, we may face tests in places that we aren't always expecting it. And so here they are before Jeremiah in the temple, and they're not just encouraged to take a sip. You know, just have like a tiny sip. There are pitchers set before them. Like, hey, drink up. What, what, what's this going to hurt? You know, just have a little bit. Come on, why not? I mean, it's a prophet of God after all at, uh, offering this to them. But they refuse. They refuse. And I, I love their explanation. They don't just refrain from wine. That, that, that's clear. They say, hey, we refrain from wine. We're not going to do it. John and Dad told us not to. But then they tell them the other things that they do as well. That we don't build any vineyards. We have no field. We have no seed. We're not even going to be tempted by this because there's no way to get the wine. There's no vineyard. And then not only that, it's, well, hey, we, we don't have any homes. We live in tents. They lived a nomadic life. And what did this lifestyle do for the Rechabites? It made them a very unique people. Probably made them look a little weird, even among the people of Israel. Why are they doing all these things? Why don't they have homes? Why do you live in a tent? We're not in the 40 years wandering in the wilderness anymore. But this is what they did. They were going to sell themselves for a cheap pitcher of wine. They made up their mind. They had a clear understanding of who they were and what they lived by. And there's... A lesson in that for us today as Christians. That as Christians, as children of God, we are a holy people. Set apart. Sanctified by the blood of Christ. And that means we're going to look different. We're going to act different than the world around us. And I hope that we have been deeply rooted in truth. That we have been taught up in the ways of the Lord. And what His Word says. That we've made a line in the sand. That this is what I'm going to live like. And this is how I'm going to serve the Lord. But my point in this, in this thought here is, well, where are the teachers at? It's hard for people to build convictions like that and listen if no one's teaching, if no one's bringing them up in the Lord. And so fathers, do you lead? Mothers, do you lead as well? Do you teach and support the leadership of your husband? Elders, do you shepherd the flock of God? And the list could go on and on and on. In every single one of our lives, we have an area of influence. We have an area of leadership where we are leading others. And you may say, well, that's not true for me. I don't lead anybody. It may not always be with your words. It may be with, through the very actions of your lives that you are leading others. And with that, our, how do you lead them? How do you teach them. You know, to lead and to teach like Jonadab, it's going to require persistence. 
Ephesians 6, 4, going back to that, that same book and chapter, later on there from chapter 6 and verse 1 down in verse 4, what does it say? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up. A phrase that means as they get older, as they grow. There needs to be leadership. There needs to be teaching. Teaching that's done with discipline and instruction. Oh, that's going to require diligence. It's going to require persistence and patience as well. But it reminds us that teaching and discipline, it can only be done on Sundays. It's not enough if we depend solely on a Bible class teacher to bring our kids up in the Lord. That's not enough. That's not the biblical pattern. It starts in the home. No, I, I wish we had a record of how John Adapt taught. I mean, really, uh, we can't think of, we probably don't know. Maybe someone here does. You've looked up Ancestry.com or something. We don't know who our descendants were 240 years ago. And I want us to appreciate that that far out, they not only knew John Adapt, but they knew what he taught. They knew what he stood for, and that's what they followed as well. And I hope we appreciate that about the Rechabites. And what an effective teacher John Adab must have been. I don't know how he taught. I can only speculate. But we can see from Scripture and infer from this chapter, he instilled those teachings deep within the heart of the generations that were following. And that's a good model and a goal for us to be following as we teach the next generation, as we teach our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids, if we live long enough to see that day. And so as we apply this point, particularly to the home, parents, but especially fathers, we need to look to our families and we need to look after them and consider how we are leading, how we are teaching our family. Is that something we even do? Are we teaching them actively in God's word? Jonadab made it clear what his family was to do and not to do. And it reminds me of the teachings of Jonadab, almost echo similar language from Joshua 24, when Joshua is giving that final option to Israel of, hey, who are you going to serve? What does he say in verse 15, a verse you probably have hanging in your house somewhere? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I want to finish with this thought here. Kind of a negative point, but I'm going to try and spin it in the positive. Don't obey like Israel. Don't obey like Israel. They are the lesson here. In particular, I, I use Israel as a broad term, but we're talking about the southern tribe of Judah at this time. Israel's already been carried off into captivity. Judah and Jerusalem is all that remains. And the, the point of this chapter can be summarized in this statement. That if the Rechabites faithfully obeyed laws that were man-made, then how much more should Israel have obeyed laws that were given by God himself? And that's why God uses the Rechabites. That's why God uses this little illustration, this little experiment with the Rechabites. Hey, here's some wine. You're going to drink it? They say, no way. We can't. Jonadab said not to. And then Jeremiah is supposed to do what? Take that and go to the people of Judah and say, hey, look at the Rechabites. They're obeying these man-made laws. These things that in of themselves weren't sinful, but it's how they determined they were going to live. And so how much more should Judah not be submitting their will, listening and obeying the word of the Lord? Six times in this chapter, the Rechabites say that they will not disobey their father. Their mind was made up. They were determined in what they were going to do, how they were going to live. And that's how it should be, right? You know, when, when a parent gives a command, the children should obey. And for 240 years, that's been the norm for the Rechabites. And you know, 240 years, I keep mentioning that, but that's a long time. Almost as long as this country has been around. And in our country today, how much has it changed over the last 250 years? Drastically. Every month, every year, laws are changing. Things are being amended. Things are being changed. And so many times, the changes that take place in a culture, in a society, are to match that of the culture in society. How easy do you think it might have been for the Rechabites to say, you know, well, in the year 841, when Jonadab made those commands, 
the housing market wasn't very safe. Now is an okay time to build property. Or maybe what if they reasoned and said, well, hey, that was the cultural context of that time to not drink, new wine, to drink wine. They haven't had the new wine that exists today. It's fresh off the grapes in southern Judah. You'll love it. Well, what if they started the reason like we do today? That, well, times have changed, so God's word needs to change as well. That's not what we see from the Rechabites, though, do we? Not at all. They're unwavering in their commitment to obey what they were taught. And the obedience of the Rechabites teaches us that time should not dull our conviction to what has been commanded. Time shouldn't dull our conviction to obey. You know, there's a phrase by C.S. Lewis, and it's called chronological snobbery. And he's kind of coined that phrase. If you've never heard it, I'd encourage you to look it up a little bit. Study this idea, and I think you'll see how prevalent it is in society today. It's this idea that the past is outdated. That, you know, because where we are on the timeline of eternity means that we are more sophisticated. We know more than those who have come before us. And this becomes a huge roadblock for people even coming to Jesus or knowing God because what are these ancient truths? What is this, this old book? What relevance does this have for my life today? Because time has gone by. Suddenly, does that mean that God's word is no longer true? That it no longer matters? I mean, it's just, it's so petty. It really is that we feel so empowered in our knowledge and our insight because of where we are on the timeline. Because we're living in the year 2022. We suddenly have better insight. We suddenly have better understanding. You know, you look back 30, 40 years ago, every movie, every TV show, what were people doing? They all had cigarettes in their mouth. And suddenly what did we realize? Oh, those those aren't good for your health. What are we going to, what, what's going to happen 20, 30 years from now? Oh, staring at a phone for 12 days? That wasn't good. Remember when people did that? Yeah. Maybe we're not as, you know, advanced or progressed as we like to claim we are. And so if we wish to have proper obedience toward God and his word and obey what he has commanded, we need to quickly realize that truth doesn't have an expiration date. Truth doesn't expire just because we're living in the year 2022. And I know we make claims, we hear it all the time, that we've progressed so much as a society. We've increased in our knowledge. We have an increased sense of awareness. But does that mean we're seeing insight in the scripture that Peter, that John, that even Jesus himself didn't see? We need to be very careful. We need to be very careful if that's how we're viewing scripture and God's word. Are we really that more sophisticated? And better yet, are the biblical truths irrelevant today but not 2,000 years ago? Absolutely not. The Lord's commands do not spoil with time, and neither should our determination to follow them. Israel, simply put, did not obey what the Lord had said. And so don't obey like Israel, because they didn't obey. Jeremiah 35 and 16 simply says, The sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have kept the command that their fathers gave them, but this people has not obeyed. God requires obedience. doesn't mean we're earning anything. It doesn't mean it makes us worthy in any way. But Jesus himself echoed this sentiment in Luke 6 and 46. When he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? He expects us to be listeners of what we have been taught and obey it. Some of the key words we've been talking about in this lesson this morning. Listening, teaching, and obeying. If you look at that next verse, though, Jeremiah 35 and verse 17, the Lord says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of the God of hosts, God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, and they have not listened. I have called to them, and they have not answered. It just makes it extra heartbreaking when we read over this chapter that God was calling out to his people, pleading with them to come back, and they would not listen. And this is the benefit of studying Old Testament passages like this, that we can study and we can learn so we don't make the same mistake. Because we learn in passages like Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that Jesus today is calling all men to Him. 
Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is calling out to those, seeking those who would answer. And maybe we have some here this morning who you're ready to answer the call of Jesus Christ, ready to respond to the gospel. If you're here and subject to heaven's invitation anyway, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song. Select.